Okay, we're starting. A couple announcements before we begin. Um, so I'm not exactly sure yet, but the test one will be around spring break. I'll be sure like within a week of the actual test, but um, so it's around spring break. It's either going to be um, just before you leave, maybe the Tuesday or Thursday before you leave. Or as soon as you return. <laughs> One of the other, but it's going to be around around there. It's going to be approximately around spring break is when the, the first test is going to happen. Um, so I sent an email about the CUNY Math Challenge. If you have the time, I would recommend that you actually participate in it. And so you can sign up at that link that I mentioned in the email, as well as this is perhaps the most important announcement. Um, I'm organizing a talk about linear algebra applications. This is going to be around May 10th. It's not given by me. I'm actually going to find someone who is doing some amazing things using linear algebra in real life. And I, I figured it would be nice for someone to come and talk to you about it. Very smart guy. He was actually a former professor of mine. He did teach me linear algebra. And he, he also does a lot of computer science. And he, was, he, he got a PhD in mathematics, but he, he, computer science was you know, his, his, his true love. I'm not really sure about how the story actually happened, how he became a mathematician. But even while he was a mathematician, he was writing a lot of papers in computer science. So he, he was really into computer science, and it's kind of what he's known for. Like, he's written books, but they're about computer science. They're not about mathematics. And so he does use this in real life. He is, so he was a professor here a few years ago. I think he then went to Google, and now he's working for Waymo or something like that. So Waymo is this company um, that's a, a sub-company of Alphabet. And what they're kind of doing now is kind of the self-driving car thing. So he's actually responsible for both programming and hardware of, about the AI that would go into a self-driving car system. So that's what he's currently working on. And he uses linear algebra all the time. And he knows a lot about computer science, so he knows a lot about where other people are using linear algebra. So I figured it would be really nice. I mean, a lot of things can be lost here in the theory when we me telling you, oh, here's how you add two matrices, here's a vector space, and you can kind of, you know, for the math majors, usually they won't care, but for most of you who are computer science, or if you actually care about what does this mean for my life, how am I going to use this, it turns out that linear algebra is used um, virtually everywhere. Um, and so I'll have, I'm trying to organize a talk about, so he's going to come here, and during that lecture, I believe this is a Thursday, so I won't be giving a lecture, he'll be here and he'll actually talk to you about using linear algebra. He'll give you some, some things where you, he was even giving me some examples. I'm like, really? <laughs> so it's going to be like, yeah, it's like, oh yeah, you can use this matrix here to figure out this graphics rendering app for me. He's like, how the hell do you use a matrix to figure out graphics? Right, so he can talk about all that cool stuff. Um, I'm not a computer scientist. I've never really done computer scientist, so I, I can't really tell you about the useful applications. I can kind of give you ideas about the kind of problems you might want to solve, but um, I think this will be a good, uh, a good talk. Um, his name is Peter Brinkman, by the way. Um, um, so if you want to look him up, he's a former uh, professor here, and yeah, so we left. So I, I'm kind of in talks with him about organizing a talk for him to come here during one class time and actually talk to you guys about the cool side of linear algebra, the kind of things that Javon can't tell you about. So I, I, I figured that would be a very nice exposure for you guys. Hopefully we can record it. I'm not exactly sure if we can record it because, you know, you're like non-disclosure agreements. It's all very technical because he's really on the cutting edge of things, you know, so they don't want to risk him saying too much on camera. And like, oh, really? That's what Google is working on. And then, you know, so, um, Hopefully I can record it, um, maybe not, but that's just, I, I think it's something really exciting to look forward to, and you'll probably enjoy that 
more than any class we have here. Um, so those are just some uh, announcements I wanted to make today. Right? So this one's important. This one's even more important, I would say. All right, so you can really see um, how linear algebra is used. This one is optional. It really, it's, if you have the time for it, I think it'll be really nice for you to do it, um, especially since it's the kind of, it's not like standard math problems that they'll be giving you, so you'll have to think outside the box. A lot of times you have to write proofs, so it's a good exposure, um, but it will take a lot of time. Um, so how the competition goes is that usually like every week or every two weeks you get a set of problems to do and then you submit it and then they grade it and then the people with the highest grades move on to the next round and it keeps repeating until you get to the final round and that's, that's sort of how things happen. So um, it will take a lot of time so if you're just taking a lot of classes don't worry about it but if you have some spare time and you like working on math in your spare time uh, I think that it'll be a really good experience to do that. Okay? So that's, I just want to make sure say all that before I forgot. And we are going to actually continue our discussion of linear algebra at the level of Math 346. But that is something you definitely want to mark your calendars and try to be here for that in case I can't record it. So I actually move on. Where were we? Last time we spoke about determinants and how to compute them using row operations. We've talked about a lot of theorems that talk about specifically how certain row operations affect determinants. Um, so recall. So in terms of determinants, what do type one operations do to determinants? Right, so this is an operation where you switch two rows. Yeah? It negates the determinant. So it turns the sky into a negative. And he'll be a lot better at also exploring the geometrical side of things. So he's, he can fully explain to you in more time than I have what it means to have a negative determinant. It's a matter of orientation kind of thing. Um, type 2. This is when you multiply a row, a single row, by a non-zero scalar. What does this do to the determinant? It scales the determinant by the same scalar. And type 3? No effect. And Peter was the guy who reminded me, oh yeah, that's just a shear. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, I forgot what the formula for shear looks like. Because um, we'll do that like way down, like that's material for the third test, I wasn't thinking that far ahead. Um, so it will have no effect on the determinant. Um, I was kind of hand waving with the proof here, but I will expect you to know whatever I proved regarding these in detail. So be able to write out a proof. Um, notice that you can use without loss of generality. Right, so remember what that was. This is without loss of generality. It's a way to get away with um, proving a general thing using a specific example. If you can justify the fact that what I did in this specific circumstance can easily be generalized to more general circumstances. Right? So if I want to prove something about matrices, I can just show you. Let me illustrate for three by threes. Use ellipses and it's exactly the same for any size. Like you can do something like that. You call that a, a without loss of generality proof. Or a proof where you can talk about, oh, how does switching two rows affect the determinant? You could prove that by saying, without loss of generality, just pretend we switch the first two rows, right? Whereas the theorem talks about any rows, but you can say, if I can talk about row one and row two, the exact same argument would apply with any other rows. Whenever you can make an argument like that, Call that a without loss of generality argument. So like row one and then row n? Yeah. Right? In, in which case, you're, you're specifically given a proof about switching row one with someone else. But if you can do the proof of the row one, you could obviously pick any row. You know? So it, it kind of can make things a little bit easier. You have to make sure, though, when you do use this proof, it does generalize easy. Right? It, it is something where you can literally replace row one with anything else in the proof not rewrite anything, and it'll be exactly the same proof, right? That's the kind of idea that you want to use, okay? So you can talk about two specific things, but you can generalize it, and that's, that, that's a without loss of generality. 
So we actually looked at the proof for this. We also had a couple other theorems. We spoke about the fact that the determinant of A plus B is not the same as the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. We spoke about the fact that if I want the determinant of A times B, that is? Right, so determinants actually distribute across products. Um, this guy actually implied another theorem that the determinant of A raised to a constant, meaning A multiplied by itself k times is just the determinant of A raised to that constant. So if you know the determinant of a matrix and you want to figure out what is the determinant of this matrix raised to some power, you don't have to actually compute the power and then find the determinant. You can actually just use this guy. You can just prove this guy by induction. Um, I didn't give you the induction argument here, but there's a theorem that I'm going to prove today where I would use a very similar induction argument that you would use here. Um, so we can do that. What other theorems did I tell you guys about? Uh, determinant of A transpose. Okay, we know that the determinant of A transpose is exactly the same as the determinant of A. What else? Yeah. I defined an inverse. Did I talk about determinants of inverses? Not yet. Okay. And that's where we kind of stopped, right? So these things will be important. We will be using them from time to time. Uh, so let's actually move on. Did someone say something? Any questions before we begin? So the determinant of transpose A is equal to the determinant of A? Yes, all right. because all the transpose does is turn the columns into rows, or rows into columns. So instead of expanding along a row, it's exactly the same as if you expand along that column, because all the, the positions of the numbers will be relative. Um, yeah, so let's actually move on. To talk a lot more about inverses and to prove a lot of nice things about inverses, there is something else I need to introduce to you. It's the concept of an elementary matrix. So let's talk about elementary matrices. There's a major theorem in linear algebra called the equivalence theorem. Hopefully I'll have some time to actually uh, prove a part of that for you guys, but if not, this is this will keep us busy until then. So let's talk about what an elementary matrix is. Elementary matrix E. E is the standard notation, so unless otherwise stated, if I write uppercase E, I'm talking about an elementary matrix. Right? So you can just make a note of that. So this is standard notation for elementary matrix. So an elementary matrix E is, can anyone tell me what an elementary matrix is? Anyone know? Um, yeah? It's a matrix you can obtain by uh, doing one row operation from identity. Exactly. It's a matrix that is obtained by performing a single row operation on an identity matrix. So if you can get to that matrix by doing literally one row operation on an identity matrix, such a matrix is called an elementary matrix. So for example, E equals 1, 0, 0, minus 1 is elementary. 
because all you did was uh, type 2 on I2, right, where you multiply row 2 by minus 1. Right, so if you take I2, you multiply row 2 by minus 1, you obtain that matrix. It's an elementary matrix. You did a single row operation to obtain that matrix, starting with the identity. You can also look at something like that is an elementary matrix, because this just means you took row 1 and added to row 2 in I2. Another example is something like One zero three zero one zero 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 one. Because all you did here was you took row one and replaced it with three, added three row three in I three. So that's the idea of an, uh, an elementary matrix. It's just a matrix that you perform a single operation or single row operation on uh, an element on um, an identity. So let me give you an example of us switching two rows. It'd just be like this guy is also an, an elementary matrix. Here you just swap two rows. In I2. Okay. Now the important thing about elementary matrices, we know that if we, an identity matrix, we know what was the property that made an identity matrix an identity matrix. It was the fact that if you multiply a matrix by the identity, it just gives you itself. The reason why elementary matrices are useful is that they kind of make the identity matrix bias in some way. And that bias will translate into the multiplication. Right? So it turns out why elementary <laughs> matrices are important is because they give us a theoretical tool for talking about row operations. I can literally think about row operations in terms of matrix multiplication. And that, we can derive a lot of things from that. So for example, there's a method by which we can find inverse, inverse matrices. And I'm going to use the fact that we can think of row operations in terms of elementary matrices. Um, So let me uh, specific, specifically tell you what I mean by that. Um, I.e., given a matrix A and an appropriate <coughs> E so that uh, e A is defined. The matrix E A will be the matrix obtained by performing. row operation on A that was done on E. So I can talk about a row operation as a multiplication by an elementary matrix. So for example, in this guy, I multiply the second row by negative 1. It means if I take this matrix and multiply any other matrix, the result will be that matrix where its second row is multiplied by a negative one. Exactly the same thing that would happen to E to create it will be the, the result of that thing being done to the same matrix. So let's actually give a concrete example here. So suppose 
A is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. And E is equal to 0, 1, 1, 0. Notice what happened to create this elementary matrix is I swapped the two rows. Let's look at what EA will give us. EA will give us 0, 1, 1, 0 times 1, 2, 3, 4. What's the result of that? 3, 4, 1, 2, 4. Take this times that, you get 3. This times that, you get 4. This times that, you get 1. This times that, you get 2. Notice what happened in the result. I actually end up swapping the two rows. Exactly the same thing I did to E to create E. If I multiply that by a matrix, that same operation will be done on the matrix. Right? So instead of, instead of saying, oh, I did a type 1 on A, I can talk about that in the context of, oh, I multiplied A by a certain matrix. And this is the result. That's the idea of an elementary matrix. Yes? So in that context, I get why. Is that the proof for why the determinant changes sign? Because the determinant of RE in that case is negative 1? That's a part of it, yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. But to be able to say that, there are some other things I But it's not, it's not always that way. Like where the proof of why the determinant changes is based on this elementary matrix. No, the proof, I actually did the proof for that for you in the last class. So we never even spoke about elementary matrix. But it does give you another geometric interpretation. right? So doing this, what that means is you're switching the orientation on the identity matrix. And so you multiply it by a matrix, it's going to switch its orientation. So you can think of it in terms of that way. But it's just another way to look at row operations. You're, you're defining row operations now in terms of matrix multiplication, which is, is useful. We can derive a lot of nice theorems um, using that fact, which we will derive. Um, what else do I do? Okay. So here's a fact, um, which kind of, is kind of a theorem. Elementary matrices are always invertible. Given an elementary matrix, there always exists some other matrix that if I can multiply by E, I will get the identity back. What do you think? The opposite. Of right. It's going to be the E that you created by doing literally the opposite guy. right? So if E was created by switching two rows, just multiply it by a matrix that switches those two rows back, and then it will turn it back into the identity. Right? Um, so the proof of that, you, you can do it in general, but I'm going to be a little bit hand wavy with this because I want to get to some really nice things. Um, so given E, Take the matrix E1 that did the opposite row operation on I. Then, if I take E1 times E, I will get the identity. Right? Because I just so if what E did was multiply the second row by two. E one is going to be the operation divide the second row by two. Right? And so if I I take the operation divide the second row by two that was already multiplied, I would bring back to the identity. And so on and so forth. Right? And these these operations are always reversible because you literally just do because you're never doing something like division by zero, right? It, it'll work out because the arithmetic will work out. Switching two rows, just take the matrix that switches them back. You multiply, a row operation is only to multiply by a non-zero constant. We'll always be, then be able to divide by that constant to get back to the other one. Right? And then we can, if we 
replace one row by adding the, a multiple of another row, just do another type three that subtracts that same multiple of that row. Right? You'll always be able to re reverse a row operation. And that's because row operations do not change the solution set, so you do not lose information by performing row operations. You'll always have as much information as you started with, so you'll always be able to go back to what you started with. Okay. So row operations are always inverted. Right? Just take the matrix that does the opposite, and that's your inverse. So this would mean that E1 is equal to E inverse. So that's the first factor. Here's another theorem. If A n by n is a matrix, then the reduced row echelon form of A. will either, it either will reduce to the identity i n, or will have a row of zeros. So for square matrices, their reduced row echelon form, you will hit one of two cases. Either you will get the identity matrix of the same size, or you will have a row of zeros, or one or several rows of zeros. Um, by cases. Find the reduced row echelon form of A, which we know how to do, just do a bunch of row operations to get into that special form. two cases that can possibly result from this. Either the rank of this guy is n, or it's not. Remember what the rank was? It's the number of pivots, right? So, one, if rank is n, this means that there are n pivots. This means that there's a pivot in every column. Which means there's a pivot in every row. There are n rows. So we get I n, right? That's the diagonal matrix that has n pivots, right? Of course, if you don't have n pivots, it would mean there's some column that would not have a pivot, which by definition would mean there's a zero row. If we don't have, so this is case two, if we don't have n pivots, then some column will not have a pivot. But the, the thing is, it's a square matrix, right? So the number of columns and the number of rows are the same. If you don't have enough pivots to fill up all the columns, you're not going to have enough pivots to fill up all the rows. Kind of a pigeonhole principle argument there, but, but we'll, we'll cross that. We'll just run with it. Uh, not have a, some column will not have a pivot, which means some row will not have a pivot. This gives a zero row. So that was approved by cases. 
ultimately what I want to build up to is, one, the equivalence theorem, and two, methods of how to deal with inverses and how to find them. So that's why we're, we're sort of building all this machinery up. You'll realize it'll, it'll all come together eventually. Here. The product of two invertible matrices is also invertible. Let's say it's a n by n, and b n by n is also invertible. In fact, if I take a times b and I want to find the inverse, anyone knows what it would be? So another professor of mine called this the shoes and socks law, right? So you can imagine putting on your shoes and socks. If you put on your socks and then your shoes, and you want to reverse that, which is what an inverse does, it reverses an operation, how do you remove it? You have to first remove the shoes, then remove the socks, right? The socks went on first, the shoes went on second. To undo that process, the shoes have to come off first, and then the socks comes off second. So you perform one operation, then another. How do you reverse it? Well, you reverse the second operation first. So what you'll do is you'll take the inverse of b and then apply the inverse of a. Undo the b, then undo the a. So it turns out um, I can prove this by literally telling you how to do it. So if I have two matrices that are invertible, then the inverse of their product will be that. And you can prove that proof. Multiply, take AB times the inverse of A. By definition, this is what? What's B times the inverse? Identity. It's the identity. So this is just A times the identity. And what's A times the identity? Well, it's just A. And what's A times the inverse? Well, that's the identity. I'm using here the, the associativity of matrix multiplication. I, I think I didn't give you the algebraic properties of matrix multiplication yet, but um, we will do that some other time. I'll do that later. Um, basically, uh, associativity, like in real numbers, if you have a bunch of things being multiplied, you can literally choose any two to multiply first. Right? So I can choose to multiply these two first, and then that's the result that I can multiply these two first, and then I multiply those two. I'm using associativity. Right? Um, and so the idea is, right, whether I, and, and the same thing would happen as you can see on the left, then the A and the A inverse would be right each other, beside each other, that creates an identity, and then the B's will be left over. Right? So that's literally the proof. So here's something that we'll need later, and this is the inductive argument that I'm going to talk about. It's a very common uh, technique. And you would use the same kind of uh, argument to prove that, you know, the determinant of a product of two matrices is just the product of the determinants, so that the determinant of a product of n matrices is the product of n determinants. It's the same kind of argument. So that leads us to this theorem. Let A1, A2, a k b invertible matrices of the same size. Then the product a one times a two times a k is also invertible. In fact, 
just apply the shoes and socks law again. Just the inverse is just going to be the product of the inverses in the opposite order. In fact, a1, a2 to ak inverse is just going to be the ak inverse, ak minus 1 inverse, all the way back down to your a1 inverse. I'm going to prove this. some facts about inverse. Proof. We proceed by induction. On K. Or I could have said any of what I mean. uh, Proceed by induction on K. Base case. What do you want to use for the base case? Just like two, right? One. Let's start there. You could even use one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one is better. One is better. That, that's kind of, that happens often, by the way, where you can just like, obviously if there's just one, it's true, right? If you just have one matrix, then its inverse is just the inverse, because you know that it's invertible. <laughs> so you could actually do one, right? So uh, A1 is invertible. A1 inverse is its inverse, which is a product. Turns out the definition of a product includes just having one thing hanging around. Uh, uh, also, for Two of them, which we're going to use this fact, so I, I want to just mention it. For A1, A2, the inverse is A2 inverse A1 inverse by previous theorem. So I know it works for up to two. Right? So that's the base case. I'm, I'm going to use the base case of two. Um, so the, now we're going to do the inductive hypothesis. Assume true for n matrices, we show it is true for n plus 1 matrices. That's how induction works. If you pretend it works for n things, it will work for n plus 1 things. So you get this kind of domino effect. You know it works when there's literally one. So if you assume it works for any number you currently have, it will work for more, then it will literally work for any amount. Right? Because if it works for one, it will work for two. If it works for two, it will work for three. If it works for three, it will work for four. And you just have this domino effect. So it means that it don't, no matter how many matrices I started with, this formula will expand to, to account for all of them. Okay. Okay. So here's how we're going to do it. So we know A1, A2, all the way up to An has the inverse An minus 1 all the way down to A1 inverse. Now here's a little trick that's going to be very kind of sneaky. I'm going to call this one name. Let B be that matrix. So I just call that a bunch of these products by just like one name. Then, 
a1 times a2 times a n, and I find an n plus 1 matrix, the, these are all invertible, that would be equal to. Uh, professor? Yeah. Is, isn't that one auto inverse? a2 inverse. Here? Yes. It'll actually be nicer if I cross this out. It'll be nicer. <laughs> My argument will still hold, but it'll actually be nicer if you let B be the original problem. It'll look nicer. But it, it really doesn't matter. Because whether or not I pick either B, I know it's inverted. So this set of this product here, I can just write it as a product of two things. So I took a bunch of these sets, but I just think of them as two sets, where the first n of them being multiplied will give me some n by n matrix, call that guy B. And then the last one that we just tapped on is just itself. And so this has only two matrices. So we already proved that it works for two matrices. So base case applies. So, and so this means that if I take B, A, N plus 1 inverse, I would end up with A, N plus 1 inverse, B inverse. But B inverse would be just the inverse of all those guys in the opposite way. And this is true by the inductive hypothesis. Right? We assume that that's true, that it will work for n matrices. So that would just be a n plus 1 to the inverse, a n inverse, all the way down to a 1 inverse. So product of n plus 1 matrices. So I know it looks like a cheap trick, but it's actually mathematically valid to say something like this. You know something works with two things, and you want to prove that it works with a bunch of things, what you can do is just break that bunch up into two parts. And then because you know it works for two things, it'll work for those two parts, which means it'll work for all of the things. Right? It's a very common technique, a um, very nice technique, and it, it, it actually is pretty easy to apply. So, um, and, and it often applies with sets. That's a very common theme. So if you wanted to prove something like De Morgan's Law in general for n sets, this is the kind of trick you would actually use. There are a lot of uh, cases where you might use this technique, so I thought it would be nice for you to see it. Okay. Any questions on that? So, what is that? A, a product. This is A. So I assume that a product of n matrices will have an inverse, and I just proved that a product of n plus 1 matrices will also have an inverse. So assuming it's true for n things, I've proven that it's true for n plus 1 things, therefore it pulls in general. And this just follows directly from that. But E1 all the way up to En be elementary matrices. Of the same size. Then 
product B1 multiplied by Bn is invertible. I know that every elementary matrix is invertible, therefore a product of elementary matrices is also invertible. In fact, the inverse of the product of E1 up to En will be the inverses multiplied by each other in the opposite order. So I'll, I'll actually know a formula for it. standard ways, but it turns out what, um, what I just, this statement is going to allow me to show you one of the ways. The equivalence theorem is a major theorem in linear algebra. It's like this ongoing saga. It's kind of like the Bible. Someone writes one book and then another prophet comes and writes another book and then another prophet adds to it and they keep adding to it and adding to it and adding to it until you get this huge story. So there's something called the equivalence theorem. It's a theorem that has like 20 something parts to it. Um, but they keep adding to it. So they're like, hey, these five things are true, but then we learn another thing that's true that we can add to that and then we learn. And, and as we're going on, we're just throwing things on top of this theorem. And it's basically a, a major theorem that says, hey, all these facts are equivalent. They're all true at the same time, or they're all false at the same time. Right? So included in that theorem is going to be the fact that if A is invertible, it turns out I can write it as a product of elementary matrices, which means I will know a bunch of row operations that will transform it into the identity, which means I will need to know, I will know automatically know how to reverse that process and get the inverse of the A. Right, that's going to be the, the, the argument. Um, so we'll use part of it. So this is the theorem. It's incomplete. By the time we get to the end of this semester, we'll, we'll add to it as well, but we won't get to the full one. Incomplete. This is the equivalence theorem. statement says, let A be an n by n matrix. The following are equivalent. Right, and we kind of spoke about what that means in like lecture zero to zero, but let me just remind you. They will all be true or all be false. At the same time. I mean, here are a list of statements where if I know one of them is true, I automatically know that all of them are true. Or if I know one of them is false, I automatically know that all of them are false. Right? 
So like I said, there are 20 something things in it. Let me see how many of these statements we're going to prove. One, A is invertible. Two, so let's say I know I have a square matrix and it's invertible, I will automatically know that AX equals B has a unique solution. Remember, for any linear system, there are only three possibilities. You'll have one unique solution, no solution, or infinitely many. The claim is, if you know your coefficient matrix is invertible, your system will have one solution. Uh, the reduced row echelon form of A will be the identity matrix. The fourth statement. A, and this is the one I need to, to tell you how to do that. A is the product of elementary matrices. A product. theoretical class. The, the next one we'll do a lot of some computations just to balance things out. But to justify these computations I kind of have to give you the theoretical background. Will be theoretical. Huh? The quiz will be theoretical. Yeah, well I did do some computations in the last lecture. So you should know how to um, find a determinant using raw operations <laughs> and know how a raw operation affects a determinant as well as know some of these facts and probably use them to talk about other facts. Uh, yeah, so here's, I'm just going to prove a list of four things, but as time goes on, we'll add more things to it. So, for example, we're going to add pretty soon that the determinant of A will not be zero. It's another fact that we can prove later on, and we'll add that to it. So these are all true or all false at the same time, which means if I know the reducer echelon form of A is the identity, I automatically know it's invertible. If it's a coefficient matrix to a system, it will have one solution, and I can write it as a product of elementary matrices. If I know I can write it as a product of elementary matrices, I automatically know it's invertible, automatically know the reducer echelon form, and so on and so forth. If I know any one of these four things, I automatically know all of these four things. Right? And do you guys remember how we prove that something is equivalent? Basically show that this implies that, this implies that, this implies that, this, and then this one implies the other one. So we get a loop of things that all imply each other. Okay, so let's do the proof. I don't know if we'll finish it, but here I'm going to show that one implies two. So I'm going to do a direct proof. Eventually, I won't announce what kind of proof I'm going to do, but um, you should be able to recognize a direct proof when you see one. So assume A is invertible. Then A inverse exists. And a inverse times A will give me the identity. This means, given AX equals B, what I can do is I can multiply both sides of the equation on the left by A inverse. This part here will give me the identity times X. And the identity times x will, of course, just be x. And that's one solution. So if my, if my matrix is invertible, the solution to the system will be A inverse times B. There will be no other possibility. 
let's prove that 2 would imply 3. Assume AX equals B has a unique solution. This means if I take the augmented matrix and perform row reduction, what has to be the form? I need to be able to say the first thing is this number, the second thing is this number, the third thing is this number all the way down to the end thing. Right? So this guy here will have to be the identity. Because if it's not the identity and there's a pivot missing, what would happen? I'd introduce a parameter and I'd get infinite solutions. Right? So literally, if, if I know that has a unique solution, this can be the only thing that it reduces to. So in other words, if I take A and I perform a bunch of row operations, I will eventually be able to get to the identity. Now let's show that 3 implies 4. Assume the reduced row echelon form of A is the identity. How can you show that A is an, a product of elementary matrices? Well, how would I reduce it to the identity? I would perform a bunch of row operations, right? Each single row operation can be described as an elementary matrix. Then there is a sequence of row operations that I can describe by, say, a bunch of elementary matrices E1 to EK so that if I take A and I apply this guy and apply that guy and apply that guy and I apply a bunch of row operations, eventually that will give me the identity as a result. Right? So now I can talk about a bunch of row operations as a matrix multiplication. But we know that this is invertible. I can multiply both sides of this guy by the inverse. On this side, the inverse will kill that, and I will just get the identity times A. And in this guy, the identity times anything is just itself. Which means the identity times A would just be A. And the inverse of a product of elementary matrices is itself a product of elementary matrices. Uh, E1, E2, EK. These are all just the elementary matrices that does the opposite oper operation. So it means that if, if my reduced row echelon form is the identity, I will be able to write my matrix as a multiplication of a bunch of elementary matrices. Now let's close the loop. How do we prove that 4 implies 1? In other words, I need to know that if I can write my matrix as a product of elementary matrices, does the inverse exist? Does that necessarily mean this matrix has an inverse? Assume A is equal to E1 times EK 
we show a inverse must exist. Maybe ideas on this last one? I'm doing all the work up here, getting lonely. How would you prove that an inverse has to exist? Would you like try this by like the identity? Division doesn't exist in matrices. Yeah. Okay, so given A is equal to E1 through EK, you want to do what? Multiply both sides by the inverse of the product of the elementary matrices, which we can do with Okay, so uh, let's say we multiply on the left by EK inverse all the way down to E1 inverse A. Equal E k inverse all the way down to E one inverse times this. And what does that mean? What does the right side give us? Identity. Identity, because I just multiplied this guy by its inverse, so that side will give me the identity. And so this here, if I take the product of all of these guys, that's just going to give me some matrix, right? So I can call that B. And so that means there exists a matrix so that when I multiply by A, I get the identity. This by definition, B means B is A inverse by definition. So this is one section of the equivalence theorem. These four things will always be true at the same time because one implies the other and then it loops back. So it just goes in a continuous loop. If this is true, then that's true, and that's true, then that's true, then that's true, then that's true, and that's true. Also, it means that if this is false, then that's false, and then that's false, and then that's false. We'll stop there. Next time, we'll actually use this fact, the fact that we can do this kind of thing to find inverses of matrices, and then I'll show you another way to find inverses of matrices, and then we'll use the inverse to do so. So we'll do some computations next time. <laughs> Are there any questions? So go home and read this slowly. Uh, the kind of arguments I made in today's class are the kind of arguments I, I expected to be able to reproduce. Um, I'll see you guys on Tuesday.